And my name is uh, Yanjun Chi, and I'm from University of Virginia Department of Computer Science. And today I'm going to talk about making deep learning interpretable for analyzing sequential data about gene regulation. So I'm going to make the talk half tutorial, half about my work. So uh, as Kei Hang pointed out, this normally points um, pointing both sides. So hopefully uh, this will not be too simple for you, for those of you who know about deep learning, and will be not too hard for those of you who don't know the deep learning. So let's start. Um, I'm going to talk about deep learning basics and a little bit about history, <laughs> and also um, try to explain why it's, this is a breakthrough now. And also give a summary about recent trends about deep learning. And the current deep learning is not just this multi-layer perceptron you learned in your grad school. And there are a lot of um, new thinking and new architectures and also new usage about computer architectures. And I did a summary review last year, so with my grad students, trying to summarize all the recent state of the art deep learning papers, and we covered about 85 papers in one semester. So every paper is summarized with um, a Beamer LaTeX uh, this uh, slide presentation. So feel free to check it out, and that roughly summarizes the recent trends in a more detailed fashion. Then I'm going to talk about three different deep learning tools my lab uh, developed called a Deep Chrome, a Tented Chrome, and Deep Motif. And they are summarized into this website called deepchrome.org. And if time permits, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my other half of the work. It's to learn graph from data and from heterogeneous data. So we have a website called joinggm.org uh, to summarize all those work. So feel free to check it out. Okay, so let's start deep learning um, or just neural nets. So basic neural networks, um, we mostly just learn about single neurons, multi-layer perceptron, uh, various loss function, and training with back propagation algorithms. So I'm going to flash out each one of the topic with one slide pretty quickly. And the single neuron, uh, this is not a neuron that you learned in your neuron science. And this neuron is just a basic term about, um, just, just a term about a basic unit in the neural networks. And you can think about it just as expanded logistic regression unit. And we have a summation function and performing just the basic linear summation by learning the weights W and the bias term B. And then from the summation output Z, you feed it into a nonlinear or transfer function or called activation function to squash it into zero one range. Um, now you can think about the prediction if that's for the, some kind of binary prediction. This really just gives you the output of what's the probability that my current X is, um, will, should be classified as class one. And so here we use a logistic function in this uh, sigmoid in this position, but there are many, many other choices uh, in, in this nonlinear, um, for this nonlinear fun function. And I have a table about it. Um, so in the later slides. So you can think about this summation function and the nonlinear squashing function together as one unit. And this is what we call neuron units. And then you can just do whatever you like. You have multiple nodes, un units, in one layer, or you have multiple layers, and that just creates the most basic multi-layer perceptron. And so in this simple example I give you, this is the first layer, this is the second layer, and the output layer just has one unit. Each one of these units contains a summation function and a squashing function. And in the first layer, there are four units, in the second layer, there are also four units. So it's very, very simple. This is called multi-layer perceptron uh, neural networks. So the reason why it's um, historically why it's called multi-layer perceptron, it's because the first type of, um, the first 
neuron type was proposed is the squashing, the squashing function is the step function. And when you use the step function, and this unit is actually a perceptron proposed by, uh, in 1958. So this first simple unit, uh, neuron unit, called the perceptron, and that's why people, when you have multiple nodes in a layer, and multiple layers, uh, that's why it's called multi-layer perceptron. But the state of the art is not limited to using just the step function. We have many other choices for that squashing function. We can use stepping function, uh, logistic function, hyperbolic tenage function, or the some fun a newly proposed function called a rectifier layer function. So basically just a um, step linear function, and this is actually the most used in the state of the art uh, deep learning um, toolbox, rectifier layer. So uh, we covered we covered single neuron, multi-layer perceptron, and also different type of squashing functions. And then is um, why you use it for different tasks. And then there's some variations on the last layer. And for if for regression tasks, you can use mean square error loss. If for binary classification tasks, you can use hinge loss, all those, all this, as long as it's differentiable. And when it's for mat, uh, class classification, which is a very popular task and deep learning is really good for, we normally use some function, the last layer, use a layer called softmax layer. Uh, so the equation is also very, very simple. I'm going to just represent it in this form. So basically we classify points in a two-dimensional space into three different uh, classes. So why I'm doing this is I want to tell you a block view. And the block view is basically just consider all this as a block. So the first layer, it's a block. The second layer is a block. And the output layer, it's a different block because it uses a different type of, it's not a squashing function. If it's for classification, this is actually a softmax function. <coughs> and then for the last module or last layer, so we normally don't call it the last layer, but it's essentially also a module. And you just represent it as a error function between the predicted y and the given y. And there are variations of this last module. So there are also different colors. Um, to train this, to the training of this layer y structure, it's extremely simple too, just to cast gradient descent. And because the chain rule, the modularity of chain rule, and this, each layer's calculation, the gradient weight update is basically only limited to the information fit into the layer from the layer next to it. And the whole thing, and it's just called back propagation uh, algorithm, and the what you really need to implement. So this is a, a very easy to implement algorithm in this computer science view. You can totally do object based uh, programming, and the input is modulized only related to a layer right before it. And this update and the gradient update rules is only related to layer next to it. So think about this uh, implement, from implementation angle. I'm totally modularize all the operations only to my own module, which I'm using the block to represent it. And, and also this block, similar blocks share similar properties, a similar gradient update rules. And then this whole thing becomes a Lego building. And you can standardize them into different color blocks and different functions blocks. And the building, as long as you follow those uh, rules and make it connected, so what block and can connect to the next block as long as you follow those rules. And this whole thing just you can make it really, really deep and really, really complicated. So this all sounds great, but why people don't like it in the 90s? And so let's just roughly review about what what happened in the 90s or in the beginning of um, 2000 and from, 20, from 2000 to uh, 2011. So in the 80s, there are many different classification methods uh, was invented. 
like neural nets, boosting support vector machine, uh, maximal uh, entropy base, or random forest. So all of those are really great uh, tools we are using now in our um, whatever application we're working on, data analysis. And deep learning was, especially this really powerful two deep learning models, was not invented now. <laughs> They're both invented in 1997 and 1998. So the first mostly used now is called convolution neural nets. And Professor uh, Yang Lukong invented convolution neural nets, we also call it CNN, in 1998 for the handwritten digits recognition. And this is the first neural networks that got trained successfully with many layers at that time. And then there's another really powerful model people use now. It's called recurrent neural net, LSTM. More specifically, it's the LSTM. So LSTM was invented by Professor uh, Jorgen um, in 1997. It's really a recurrent operation to capture sequential capture um, those samples have sequential item structure inside them, uh, inside the sample. So this is also a very powerful model to capture the structure or temporal dependencies um, inside a sample data. Both of this great, but people really hate them in, from uh, roughly in 2000 to 2011. And I think roughly um, the reason is at that time, um, we like method about structure. We like method about convex formulation. And for example, like kernel learning, manifold learning, uh, sparse learning, uh, structure input output learning, uh, graphical models. Um, there are also some variations like ma matrix factorization, transfer learning, or uh, semi-supervised learning. And all those are mostly uh, we the machine learning literature really likes a formulation that is convex. But deep neural networks is super non-convex. And it needs a lot of tricks to make it work at that time. And so, like I said, you can just go crazy, go really crazy about how many nodes in your layers, how many layers, um, what type of loss function or what type of uh, topology in your architecture. But people don't know which one is the good one. And when you have limited data and limited computer resources, and you normally just overfit your training data and with these crazy layers, crazy complicated networks. And there's a reason why it doesn't work at that time. But now like, there's, there's really big changes in terms of labeled data and also in terms of computer resources. And we are able to make this kind of very complicated model run fast. And also we have those large scale data to guide this type of models, to guide the model to figure out what's the right net network structure or topologies. Um, and also, but it's still very hard for um, theoretical analysis. Okay, so again, but that's, it's people it's not like overnight they like this. And there's a really big event happening in this very large scale visual recognition challenge in 2012. So this is a very large scale image labeling task. There are about 1.2 images um, people collected from the website, uh, all this in uh, www. And then there a thousand different word labels. You need to label each images to a thousand different word labels. So think about this is a very complicated task. And also your images is about the whole world. Sorry. And this big breakthrough is before 2012, this competition, the best competition, uh, the best, uh, best team, and also the second team, uh, second best team in 2012, they are all in the range about 40, 74% um, accuracy, top five accuracy. And then this paper from Jeff Hinton's group using convolution neural nets and boost the performance from the second best with 10% improvements. So directly from 74 to 85. 
So think about our papers. A lot of those papers has even just 0.1% improvements. You think it's significant. But this is 10% on such a large scale data. And there's no doubt this is better. And this really brings back the whole deep neural network back to this people's uh, attention and then especially from industry because they have uh, bigger data, uh, better computer resources. And then just it goes really, really wild now. Uh, look at the ImageNet competition results. So from 2012, we have, so this is accurate error rate. You just do one minus 85 accuracy, you get this. This is error rate, the lower the better. And so in 2012, we have this 85 percentage of accuracy is roughly uh, 16 error rate. And then in 13, got a 12. And then in 17, you got about 2% of error rate. And this is actually already <coughs> better. I'm sorry. Question. How are they determining, determining what is correct? What is the correct classification? They use mechanical Turk to hire a human labeler to label those images. So then, what's it, why was it sent here now better than experienced humans? Saying that if you're yeah, a you're right. mechanical Turks, yeah, it, classified. So this is uh, actually one of, I think, the grad student. And she just he just trained himself for uh, four weeks. <laughs> and then he started to do the labeling. And his results is worse than this. And then we claim it's better than human. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an experience, really experience, experience labeler. So for example, bird, I mean, you know, for Earth, just the general people, we don't know birds, right? We don't know this label for a lot of birds, but for maybe some people, they really know. So even inside a human population, we have different accurate right, and reads. So which one should be the read? Is the average read, or is the experience read, or this novice read? So, so that's about the state of the art. I see, so this is ignoring in some sense some of the biases from having farmed this out to multiple humans. I mean, for example, if an image has better green, you give it to colorblind people, they won't distinguish it. Yeah, you're right. There, there are a lot. Of, so if you think about human, is human vision perfect? No. We are actually a, not a very good perception machine. OK, so this is about state of art. But convolution nets is not just good at image labeling. And it's really fundamentally improved the results for a lot of other similar tasks. I'm going to talk about what do I mean similar tasks. So, Roughly uh, summarize, um, it changes this older era of feature engineering into feature learning. You know, most of the state of, um, before the 2011, we spent a lot of time figuring out what's the right feature. And, and most of the computation actually spend on about feature, about figuring out a feature, about extracting a feature, about maybe filtering the feature. Um, but now this creates a very principled framework to learn features in certain type of applications. So this is not a magic bullet for every task. It's only good for certain tasks that it tries to model, it can model. Um, so, but again, why this is a breakthrough. So in MIT Tech Review, um, it's reviewed uh, deep learning and deep reinforcement learning and adversary, uh, generated adversary networks as these 10 breakthrough in 2013, 17, and 18. So it clearly it's been a lot of attention. And so the reason why, I, that's just what I think. Um, in the end, as a computer scientist, just now I'm positioning myself as a computer scientist, and then, then I'm going to position myself as a computational biologist later. So as a computer scientist, what the job really is to make computer intelligent. So what do you mean make computer intelligent? So roughly, you want to make the computer to be able to perceive the world, understand the world, interact with the world, 
the state of the art deep learning tools really great at making the computer perceive the world, object recognition, speech recognition, understand the world, machine translation, sentiment analysis, and interact with the world. This is still working on, uh, it's a um, work in progress, but in the limited environment like Go games, uh, games, avatar games, um, and they already perform really, really well. And people more pushes to into a self-driving car, and which it then brings a lot of concern, right? Because this environment is not um, fully knowledge. There are a lot of uncertainties. Um, and the other trend is people, I know this, the fonts is really, really small, just but this is not a bigger focus. Um, and so able to perceive, understand, interact, and also the other thing is really big happening in the deep learning field is able to reason. So if you think about reasoning, it's more like able to think. And this able to think is learning to maybe figure out what's the right deep learning architectures. We used to rely on designers or scientists to design this deep learning architectures, but can we design a deep learning protocol to figure out the right deep learning architectures for a application. So this is really, really huge. And also, can we make deep learning, or can we make computer able to imagine, make analogy? Think about this analogy ability is really something really unique to human. And this recent proposed generative adversary again really gives the neural deep learning networks this ability to make analogy. So all those, in the end, if you think about it, it's not about specific application. So everything here is about making the computer intelligent. So that's why uh, this is a big breakthrough. Okay, so then it's a quick summary about recent trends. As I uh, really, really like to think about this as a Lego building, and we can think about there's variations of input and output, and there are variations of the loss modules, there are variations of architectures, topology of architectures. There's also, uh, there are variations after you already have this learned model, what can you do on the model? And then this is roughly the list. Um, so this autoencoder, and it's more um, variation of a loss. I mean, you, you, you just using this reproducing loss to regularize your uh, learned weight matrix. That's like in this loss formulation, uh, variation of loss formulation, convolution neural nets. There's a lot of new like a residual layers, uh, dynamic parameter prediction. And RNN, the recurrent neural networks, there's a lot of work about adding attentions, which is actually uh, one of my team's uh, work. No, so which is one of my team's focus to using those, borrow those ideas in analyzing the data from biology. And then there's a lot of work about uh, explicit memory um, and so on and so forth. So if you are interested, feel free to check out our, um, our summary called Deep to Learn in um, QData GitHub repo. And what I'm going to focus on, uh, our, the tools from my team, it's about convolution neural nets, recurrent neural nets, and attention, and also explicit memory, plus understanding the learned model. Okay, questions so far? So this is the first half of the talk. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so just to show you, show you one of the crazy uh, neural networks from uh, deep learning networks from Google, and you can actually tell it's really just this blocks, uh, Lego blocks with different color coded, and then uh, make it really, really deep. Um, so in my group, um, we focus on trying to borrow and adapt those ideas from the state of the art deep learning literature and trying to figure out uh, the right, maybe very uh, right adaptation to the tasks about genomic and epigenomic data uh, about gene regulation. 
so what I want to first emphasize is I'm thinking everything from, so data from biology, especially those data capture um, the genomes, they are secretion data. So what do I mean sequential data? So what I mean is you can think about each sample, it includes multiple items in the sample and items among each other follows a temporal dependencies. So in the genomic case or epigenomic case is this genome coordinates. They are linearly dependent from each other just because of the nature of the data. And there are a lot of data is sequential data, like text data, uh, text string data, like the food is not good. I mean, you always know. So not, it's highly likely after is. <coughs> and there's, this kind of dependency is what you really want to capture in your model. And in the signals of the epigenomic feature or signals, and if there's a signal right at here, it's most likely its neighbor signals will not be zero. So that's the dependency I'm trying to capture from the deep learning architecture. Okay, this is the sequential data, and the task I'm mostly focused on is about classifying sequential data. Just to give you a really simple example is, this is classify a text sequences into not, good, not it means semantically not, it means not a positive review, but why it matters, so in our case, actually we capture either sequence input into maybe binding or not binding, or epigenomic signal input into gene expression up or down. So they are essentially similar tasks. It's sequential input samples with binary or multi-class output Y. Okay. So let's talk about a bit about biology, <laughs> finally. Um, so, the, um, so this is the um, three-level um, architecture and the standing gene organization. So um, the first level is the regulatory elements. Um, it's really the functional like enhancer gene positions or promoter positions. And then the second level is the chromatin structure like uh, histone modification or DNA methylation signals or um, like chromatin uh, remodeling. And then this uh, third level is more this long range interaction. It's more on the nuclear level, uh, um, like a 3D interactions. So, and all those, actually, all those factors uh, hypothesized to be, to contribute to the cellular phenotypes. And there are recent two big databases. One is ENCODE, it's more on the first level, on the functional annotation. Um, and the second level is this chromatin structure from the roadmap, um, roadmap uh, projects. So what our, pro um, our, our tool is mostly focused on analyzing is the ENCODE data and roadmap data. And to try to figure out what are those factors from the first, second, and third. Actually, we haven't worked on third yet. So what's the relationship from the first and second to how do they contribute to the gene regulation? Um, so just roughly, just using, you can think about this is doing segments or maybe variants of um, segments, and then it's predict. You, there are many different kind of competition you know, tasks are possible to just formulate, um, to understand. And so you can do DNA to a TFBS prediction or DNA to histone like um, a signal prediction. You can also do TF to gene, gene expression. There's people in this crowd already did a lot of this. Uh, what we focus on actually is this, is from histone modification signal from second level to the transcription output. And uh, so the reason why is so most other work, it's about histone modification to transcription factor binding and then to the gene transcription. We instead directly modeling histone modification or chromatin marks to the gene transcription output and formulated this as a prediction task. <coughs> and so why do this? Um, honestly, and this is all from my collaborator. Um, so epigenome is dynamic um, because unlike gen genetic mutations, 
it's possible to reverse the histone modifications and in resulting maybe their possibility to have epigenetic drugs and to understand how histone modification or chromatin marks control, uh, control the gene regulation can help us to understand this and the basic mechanism and also to figure out uh, what histone modification is important or uh, what interaction is important for the transcription. And then we actually really just formulate a simple, simple analogy to light switches. So we want to understand how did this histone modification, each histone modification contribute to gene on and off. And also the interaction among the histone modifications contribute to the gene on and off. And that's the simplest analogy to think about this formulation. But when you look at the data itself, uh, there are actually totally 56 um, uh, cell types from a roadmap. And the, when you start to look at the data, it's not as simple as thinking about it as a switch. Um, because first of all, um, you have this really long regions to model. And do you, so what we actually try to model is from the transcription starting side, left 5,000, um, right 5,000, and then treat each 100 as, uh, as a beam position. And then what you really have is a very long range signal to capture. And how do you thinking about how to model that interaction among histone modifications, how to model the position of histone modification contribute to the transcription gene expression. And people actually tried all these various strategies. And yeah, so the bigger computational challenge to model all this range and also model all the interactions is the search space. And so of course, I'm a little exaggerating, but this is exponential size of search space. Can I ask a question? Sure. In the previous slide, uh, what is each track? Oh, so sorry. So each one of this is just a histone modification signals. And they are all like I used, we used, um, so from, so using the transcription uh, starting site as the middle position, go left 5,000, go right 5,000. So that's like 10,000 base pair uh, range you consider. Uh, just for clarification, when you talk about signature data, do you mean uh, the, the uh, space, like sequential, or? So it's actually, uh, yeah. So it's an imagined time coordinate. So in this case, it's the genome coordinate from left to right. Location. It's actually location. In this case, it's location. Yeah. But, uh, just to, to follow up on that, so yeah. is the left to right like an implicit something that you have to make an assumption, or it's just a. Uh, 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 it's just a 5,000, 5,000. But is it because you, essentially you're trying to capture these co dependencies in the data that could go left to right or right to left? Or is, is, is the, like the second child essentially. Oh, I see your point. Okay. So. Um, in the end, it's just you think about something like a linear string, and one is before the next. So here is this one is on the left. So this being it's on the left of this being, and this being is on the left of this being. So you can think about this. Um, there's this imagine the time direction from left to right. Yeah, that I mean sequential. But of course, you can do right to left, right? There's nothing stopping you, and they're symmetric. Yeah. Um, and then, so uh, so because the search space is large, and the previous work, so either people just use the mean signals, and for each HM, you use the mean signals, and then you try to explicitly using those. Um, uh, linear models, but have interaction terms. Interaction terms means HM1 times HM2, or HMI times HMJ, whatever you consider, and you add into that linear model, you try to see, try to together predict the expressions. 
and see the higher weights maybe just the higher weights means that interacting terms is important for the uh, gene on and off. So this is one approach using just the mean. So without consider the positions at all. And the other approach is you just use a max operation. You explicitly select the best position using the just the max operation. And you're using the max actually to do this interaction prediction. Um, so there are many different type of methods proposed, like linear regression, support vector actual regression, uh, random forest. Um, we actually formulate this task instead of as regression, we formulate it as classification, uh, just to simplify it. So we use the signals. We actually just, <coughs> so rather than throwing out using only the, the best or using the average, so I think we think maybe there's some kind of model can capture all the positions and also can capture the interactions among different HMs and together to predict gene on and off. What would you say the best way is to turn this into a regression? I know, yeah, of course. So what we do so far is, um, if you think about it, classification is simpler than regression because it tries to push the signals, whatever up, it's a same pattern. It doesn't capture that really smaller details of differences. So what we think now is, I don't think the current data, the size of the data we have, it's able to learn a really good regression. And classification is uh, approximation so far. It's, you can, you can tell, I mean, I'm going to talk about it in the future slides, yeah. It's also the reason is we capture all the positions and also interaction among all the positions. In the end, the feature space is large. <coughs> and if you make your out space also very, very detailed, and this complexity of this, the, the complexity of the modeling itself is too complex. Unless you have huge amount of training data, um, um, I, I think using uh, binary classification is a bro good approximation at the current stage. Yeah. But just to, just to answer the question, you can just change the loss function from a classification loss to a regression loss. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, of course, it's, there's nothing stopping you, but just from, um, from a data um, um, angle, this available data angle, sure. Uh, you're not including no, we tried it. We actually tried it on adding sequences, adding transcription factors, adding everything. Uh, the result is actually worse using only the histone modifications. And the reason why is I think it overfits. The current signals is not enough to capture a good, a good predictor. So that's why we formulate as approximated binary classification task to make it simple, right? It's a lot simpler than the regression. Topic. Have you tried the regression function? We tried. It, it wasn't working that as clearly uh, as, it just the, all the patterns we want to learn, um, it's not as clearly or as nicely from the classification formulation. Yeah, we actually tried because all those are very, it's a Lego building, right? All the Lego pieces are ready. You just plug in and then run it. But in the end, you have to think about the capacity of the task itself, how difficult or how complicated it really is, is your current data enough to represent this complex nature of the job itself? If the data is not enough, then maybe do approximation of the formulation, make it a simple formulation. Let's do the simpler formulation first. Yeah. I don't think I fully agree with that. So I think you don't think? Yeah. I just think if you're trying to do a very complex sequential architecture, then... You Maybe because our... So in the end, so we capture a lot of regions first. If we don't capture a lot of regions, that's reduce the complexity first. And maybe that will give us the flexibility or freedom to add other features. Yeah, but in the end, this is... 
if you think about it, is how complex, how complex the phenomenon you want to capture, right? At, at what approximation level you want to capture. Okay, how many features are you using? Is it all histogram? Yeah, it's actually we just use the tier one. Tier one, there's only five. Yeah, sure. Are you generalizing across cell types or across? Uh, multi -types? You mean okay, generalize? Uh, one model per gene or one model? Yeah, so far it's one model per cell type. Or oh, per cell type across. Okay, so uh, yeah, I don't even need to talk to you why deep learning, because we capture such a longer range of regions and also interaction among the regions. Um, clearly, deep learning is a good choice. And why it's a good choice? Let's make analogy to image recognition. Oh, really? Oh, gosh. So uh, let me do it really quickly now. Um, so think about you trying to predict a bar park and you need to identify like human, tree, and sky, and then um, in our case, maybe this first signal, some modification signal, second, and then you try to predict gene on, on off. And let's use similar architectures. And the whole thing about convolution nets is this picture. So this picture tells you is the convolution net is good at capture something. This really important signal that is local and also this meaning doesn't change if this bird changed the position in the image. This is called translation invariance. So the scene itself is specifically defined or specifically designed for to capture this type of signals. Local signal and also translation invariant. And I'm going to skip it. So the whole motivation is more is HM signals also occupy a local region and also translation invariant which we hypothesize, yes, that's actually true. And that's the reason why we use the convolution nets. And then there's a lot of, so initially I want to capture, but it's really just using a specific, specially designed architecture to capture locality and also translation invariant property. Uh, this is our first work called Deep Chrome and just convolution nets. And I'm going to skip a lot of slides and do back propagation, and we tried it on uh, 56 different cell types. And so far we do a train validation test and 6,000, 6,000, 6,000. Of course we can do other ways, but that's just our first try. Um, it's the performance, it's, of course it's better than a support vector machine and also a random forest. Um, so, but this really um, has um, this caveat is this is an accurate model, but it's not very easy to do the interpretation. And this is the first implementation, and then we further improve this work by uh, proposing the second model called Attentive Chrome. So Attentive Chrome, again, it's also, let's use image analysis as analogy. So human perception, has this, it's, it doesn't focus on every positions equivalently. It has focal points. And those normally called attention mechanism. And there's deep learning, you can also design uh, similar strategies to not focusing on, on everything in your input sample, but only focus on a specific sections or specific parts of the input sample. So now we have a sequential input, rather than focus on every positions, we pick out the positions we want to focus on. That's about attention. And so this is again similar, using attention mechanism, good for visual, and we use it for histomodification signal modeling. And it trying to capture, trying to learn, using attention mechanism to learn what positions are important and what HMs are important, what HM interactions are important. So this is the work uh, published in NIPS last year. So I'm going to skip a lot of slides. This is more a hierarchical representation of the, the problem. So now we represent each HM using our RNN model and adding attention to look for what positions are important. And then we put all these HMs together and then add another attention to look for what uh, HMs and HM interactions are important. And then we do the output. 
so skip, skip. Um, so actually, attention mechanism, it's really just a learned, it's a learned weight vector trying to predict what positions are important. And then using a softmax to further adding the focus, so inside all those positions, what is the most important positions. Uh, let me skip more, and then the performance of authentic chrome versus the deep chrome are very, very similar, actually a little bit better. But uh, a big uh, a gain from this big uh, gain from this model is, so we don't need to do post-processing. So most state-of-the-art understanding deep learning work are do post-processing, and we don't do it. So from this one model, the attention weights itself already tell you what positions what positions are important, what HM is important. It's more like a feature analysis with the model itself. And then we validate this using just um, um, taking the attention weights of all the genes and then do a summary and do a mean. And so this is actually this uh, on genes attention weights. And this is the off genes average attention weights. So um, if you look at this, it's actually make a lot of sense. So details is in the paper. And you can also use this HM level attention width to think, to summarize across different cell types, how did HM contribution or importance changes? So this one tells you a specific gene across three different cell types, how their um, importance scores varies across to three different, gene, uh, different cell types. So um, in this cell type, um, it's this, yeah, I'm, I'm adding a really funny name for this histone modification to when I submit it to NIPS because those people don't even really know what is his, uh, histone modification or the terms. So this is a, a repressor, and this is for, this gene is actually off in the cell type, and this is really a good validation. It's, uh, it's very important, and um, this repressor histone marks is important, um, and then when it's changed to on, and this promoter uh, histone modification becomes important, so it's kind of like a validation, um, validate it doing something it's supposed to do. Um, and then, so we also further did using the extra, uh, extra histone modification signals we don't use and trying to do this pairwise Pearson correlation and try to compare, compare with um, some other state of the art understanding deep learning method. So these attention weights we learned actually matches, supposed to match better. So actually matches much better to this extra signals compared to the state of the art post-processing approach. So this is more like using actual data to validate and also compare to other understanding method. Okay, again, so now we're trying to push this model a little bit more understandable, but it's also still very, very accurate. So all the code I shared from dipchrome.org. And the last one, I'm going to skip it. So this is actually a post-processing. It's a toolbox we designed to perform post-processing for the state-of-art transcription factor binding deep learning models. And the specific method is called silencing map, temporal output values, and class optimization. And all the code I already shared from our GitHub repo called deep motif. And so relates to state-of-the-art approach to do post-processing or analysis of deep learning models. And roughly we have four or five category. So like deconvolution based, perturbation based, back propagation based, difference to references, or influence based. I think the journal club already read uh, a paper. Um, maybe this influence function is from this ICML 2017 best paper. And also deep leaf from Ansho and in, um, belongs to the difference to reference category. So the method we actually use, so honestly, this is just a toolbox. It's not some novel method. We just implemented and hopefully uh, people will use it. And it belongs to the back propagation based approach and also belongs to a perturbation, uh, uh, yeah, perturbation based approach. So that's 
to summarize all the three work together. Deep Chrome is the first implementation trying to capture this really longer position and the interaction among signals. It's very accurate. And Attending Chrome trying to push it to be a little bit more interpretable. And Deep Motif is this uh, post-processing tool trying to push those accurate complicated model to be understandable. And, but our goal is still very far. And also, people always believe linear model is more interpretable. Um, I think this needs a, some more discussion. OK. And the last one is about learning graphs from data. So uh, this is really uh, some graphical model flavor. Uh, so you know, um, there are quite some work, um, I think, a few years ago adding, get, uh, getting like co-expression graphs or um, uh, conditional independence graphs or correlation graphs from expression to gene networks. And we actually extended this, um, actually like Suin Li was first pioneered in this direction and trying to analyze the heterogeneous samples and to get graphs that related to each other, but there's also differences among them. So you can think about each context has a gene network, but this kind of gene network, they are all human gene networks, right? They should be similar, but there are variations across heterogeneous, uh, specific to the, each context. And uh, like maybe co-binding um, of transcription factor, you can also use such kind of graphical models to get co-binding interactions among uh, transcription factors using graphical models. And are they the same across different cell types? Or what are the specific edges? What are the shared edges? And um, yeah, let me skip a few pages. pages. And we actually propose tools to do, perform two different tasks. The first task is to capture the differences of two graphs. So to get sparse changes among two different graphs. Those graphs are related, and these two directly tell you what edges differ from maybe case versus control. I know. Last page, and then um, our two and this uh, in drunkworm.org and the point of our two is scalable. So this scalable to much bigger number of nodes. And that's about it. Yeah, got yeah, <laughs> I have to show this page. <laughs> yeah, so this is a acknowledge my uh, PhD student, also my collaborator. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah.